team where guys went on and played AFL and that, played um, a bit of rep footy. But once I got to about 13, 14, I was actually used to wear a helmet and mum wouldn't let me play anymore because um, I used to get headaches from games. And um, so I really, my, my actual playing sort of um, career was short for the mum. She just wouldn't let me do it. So I actually started band down with the Convoy Footy Club in the Eastern Footy League and um, and then my, um, our mate, uh, John Edwards and Steve Edwards, they actually got me down to do some field umpiring in the, in the Doncaster Junior League when I was 14. Let, um, 11 bucks a game as a boundary umpire, and I thought that was pretty good as a 14 year old, that was awesome. The only reason why I went to field umpiring the next year was because it was 17, 18 bucks, and I thought that's a great career move. So I was actually saving my money up for um, basically just for cricket, because I loved my cricket, and I was trying to save my money for cricket season so I could buy my cans of coke and lots of stuff. Um, so for the next four or five years, I'm home with my mates, bought my first ever car when I was 17, before I was at 18, and I thought that was awesome. And um, when I actually finished um, my year 12, I became a greenkeeper, apprentice greenkeeper, and I was actually earning more money umpiring on Saturdays and Sundays than I was um, um, actually working my full-time job as a greenkeeper. So, and I, what, I, there's a bit of a theory behind this. I actually umpired for the money. And that didn't mean that I was in it for the wrong reason. From my, from my perspective, umpire was an occupation. And an occupation meant that it came with the, the negatives. So the negatives might have been a bit of criticism, a bit of this and that. And I just thought that that was part of the job. So it didn't really get, get me too worried. So um, I actually then umpired in the Doncaster League for about eight years. I went to the Eastern Suburban Churches and started some senior umpiring because I was going to get 50 bucks a, a, a game. But that was great because Steve Edwards and all those boys were there. Look, that was terrific. I actually gave up senior footy. I was actually offered to go and asked to go down to the VFL and try with them when I was 18. And I knocked them back because I didn't really care because I wanted to basically play cricket and that was it. Um, still on playing junior footy. Went then to Yarra, Yarra Rangers and went up there because I think they might have been about 80 bucks. And I thought that was awesome. <laughs> um, and then I said, the um, first year up there, I was actually up this time to go down to trial again, and which this time I took because Steve Edwards and Shane Mason was um, asked to go at the same time, so a couple of our mates, our group of mates, so we went down there, and um, first straight away 200 odd bucks a game, and I was, I was in, I was in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I thought that was terrific, and, and I can honestly tell you for the next four or five years, just umpired VFL footy, did not care about umpiring at AFL. Matter of fact, at the start of the 98 season, one of my other mates, Darren Earth, remember Earthy? Um, him and I made a pact that we were going to leave VFL at the end of that year and I was going to go and play footy for Mitchum. And it just depended on how we went, but that's what I was going to do. And by the end of the 98 season, I don't know why, um, I was actually asked to try with the AFL squad. And I'm like, what the hell is going on here? You know, I, I never really dreamt of it, but I just happened to be in the right spot, right time, and got on straight away. And I just could not believe it. And um, best thing about it, and I've got to be honest with you, best thing about it is basically sign on fee straight away, 45 grand. <laughs> Just doing 11 bucks a game, and I thought that was awesome. And I'm getting 45 grand straight away, sign on fee, and a um, yeah, thousand, might have been 1200 bucks a game. Awesome. And here, I, you know, up to 11 years or 12, 13 years later, and most of the guys, you know, on 60, 70 grand sign on plus 1700 bucks a game, um, 17 grand for the grand final one. And, and the reason why I plant the picture about the money is because, you know, seriously, you can actually earn some really good money out of umpiring, and I've actually got a full time career out of it. And, you know, 13 years of umpiring, I put it, got up by in every state and all that stuff, great. But some of the biggest, great, greatest memories are going and umpiring in London, um, New Zealand and Dubai. I mean, I don't think anyone been to Dubai, but it's the most amazing place ever. And where the game was held in Dubai was, was the NAB Cup game in 2008. And um, what happened was the actual, there was two sheikhs in, in um, Dubai who were actually trying to outbid each other for the rights for the game, believe it or not. And the actual game was held in one of the guys' backyards. And this is a, not a, this is an absolute true story. You go onto Google Maps and you actually see his place, but it's halfway between Abu Dhabi and Dubai, right? Um, it's about 45 minutes out of Dubai. It's this guy's private palace. And in his backyard, he had a camel racing track, because camel racing is really big over there, a little grandstand, his palace. And um, the actual game was held on this, this area of pure turf, about two hectares of pure turf. And they put four goalposts on either end. One side they had all the grandstands, and on the other side where the cameras were, there was nothing basically except for a couple of portables, so it looked like there was heaps of people on the ground. But um, unbelievable experience, and the footy gave me that. Um, you know, um, uh, 
uh, Simon mentioned before that I'm now a life member, so I can go to any game for the rest of my life. Um, two free tickets to the grand final, um, you know, all I can eat and all I can drink and whatever for the rest of my life. So I'm really, really... Once again, the pros of um, umpiring. Um, if you think about a few of the... Uh, a few of the players along the way, you know, Favola, you know, real sort of smart ass out the ground. But that's sort of like he, he, what he's like. Um, Acker, Acker's the true smart ass. So when you went into the rooms before the game and met Acker and all that, he used to um, talk to you in Spanish. It wasn't until later that I actually found out he was swearing at us in Spanish. So, and um, he's making fun of you in Spanish and you just didn't need to go, whatever. So I thought oh, I was pretty smart ass that one day. So I actually swore it back at him in Italian and he had no idea what he was doing. <laughs> And then you've got a couple of the coaches, um, you know, Moldhouse and, and Rod and Eddie, they go to the room, go to the rooms before the game. And they, I don't know why they thought it would work, but, you know, you probably get the coaches in, in this comp where they try and win you over, you know, before the game and, and try and get into your ear about, you know, this guy doing this and whatever, and, you know, whatever. But, um, it was, you know, Grant Thomas, uh, Grant Thomas, and I, someone might know him, but he was an absolute arsehole. So Grant <laughs> Thomas used to deliberately walk away from you and not acknowledge you and that stuff. And um, he used to lock himself in a room so you couldn't say good day to him. But my old man always said, say good day to someone who never wants to say good day to you because it really hurts him. So we used to deliberately go and follow him into this room and say good day to him because we knew it really pissed him off. <laughs> <laughs> and that was true because he used to treat up by like absolute dirt, you know. Um, There's one time there where Fred Allen, who's a fantastic bloke, um, was by himself in Qantas Club. And travelling by yourself can be quite intimidating when you travel with, um, with clubs. And, you know, right in front of everyone, Grant Thomas belittled him and told him how shitty he was and all that stuff. And, you know, that's the sort of bloke that Grant Thomas was, just, you know, um, it's all about him and all that stuff. But um, uh, probably the best bloke was actually Mark Williams. Absolute terrific bloke, um, really down to work. What you see is sort of what you sort of get with him. Love to have a bit of a joke with you. And he was the actually only coach or only club that he was in charge at the time they actually invited us back to their club after the game for an after-match function. It happened to be in my first game, so um, he was a terrific bloke. Um, and then you got the guys like, um, say, say Glenn Archer. Glenn Archer was real pirate. I loved umpiring him because he was pretty clean cut. Um, back in the early 2000s, when you know Geesh sort of brought in this thing about you know abuse, as soon as we someone abuses, we had to do something about it. And he, back in the early 2000s, he was one bloke who couldn't. He struggled with it, and I had to play a um, 50 against some other player for North and put him back onto the goal line. Actually, against him, sorry. He grabbed the guy around the head and uh, brought him back onto the goal line. And I could just see him struggling with it because he wanted to say something with him. He was almost shaking. So I brought him back onto the goal line. You know, you do that to bring him back. And what he did, instead of standing there like that, he stood there looking at me like this. And what he was doing, because he's you know, pretty big, like, he was actually blowing on my hair, if you know what I mean. Like, I'm standing and lining him up and the head down. You know, <laughs> And here he comes up behind me, and I'm thinking, right, he swears at me, and I've got to play a free kick. And um, he comes up to me instead and goes, um, oh, I bet your old man's ashamed of you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, no, actually, as a matter of fact, he's really, really proud of watching me umpire champions like you. And then he told me to get fucked. So, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I didn't dare pay for it. He didn't get me. So I played the world. But, um, um, the other one, like Barry Hall. Barry Hall was a player that just, he just got into you so much it wasn't funny. And um, the thing that really annoyed me was, you know, and you probably think the same, that he, he got, you know, probably harshly dealt with over his career and all that. And whether he did or not, oh, I don't know, maybe he did. But if you ask any footballer whether it was, what would you rather? Would you rather miss, miss, have a one or two free kicks missed throughout your whole career in a home and away and get one in a grand final or something where you can make the most of it when it wasn't warranted? What would you take? And they'd all take that opportunity in a grand final and make the most of it. The worst free kick I ever played in my whole career was actually Barry Hall. Third quarter, halfway through the third quarter in the 2006 grand final. Got whacked here, threw his head back, and I got sucked in, right? Got sucked in, paid the free kick. 30 metres directly out in front of the goal. I wasn't even in control. So Darren Goldsmith was in control, right? And so I paid it from out of zone. And um, he's directly in front of the goal. He kicks a point. He right? kicks a point. Can anyone remember how many, um, what the margin was in that grand final? One, one point. point. West Coast <laughs> won by one point. 
Barry Hall had a chance to change history, right? Put on a free kick, he never deserved. And I'll tell you right now, I, I reckon I'll just about neck myself if, I, if bloody um, Sydney had got up and won because I would have had to live with that for the rest of my life. I've never watched that game back, never, never don't want to, because of that one free kick. And I must admit, thereafter my career, um, he had to get every free kick he got, he had to absolutely go, and it's just a human nature. Right? Because you know, I'm a proud bloke. I didn't want him to win a battle because he won that battle. If you know what I mean. So, and I've told footy pubs this and all that. Whenever I go to clubs and say, you know, you've got to make sure you don't abuse umpires because umpires are really proud people, right? They don't want to let players who abuse them win. And because if they feel like they win, they'll do it again and again and again. And I said to him, you know, and Barry Hall, he never got much after that because I didn't want him to win our battle because that's what I saw it as. Um, so that was the worst free kick I ever played in my life. Probably one of the, the most awkward moments in my life, which I, um, I never knew until a bit later on. Later on. I was up on in um, London, and um, everyone gets absolutely maggot at there, absolutely pissed. And these Fosters, in this day, these Fosters, they were putting on all the drink, and, and they were all Aussies, and they're blind drunk. And um, I, it's about the 20 minute mark last quarter, the ball's up the other end, and I'm standing up this end of the ground, excuse me. And um, I hear the crowd roaring, and this absolutely true story. It's turned around, and there is one of my brother's best mates from Melbourne. I didn't even know he was in London. He's jumped up on the fence and he starts running onto the ground. And I'm thinking, oh, what's he doing there? Well, get back. Next thing, our security guards grabbed him, thrown him back over the fence. And um, after match, I see him and I, I went, caught up with him. I said, well, what were you doing, mate? And um, in those days, the game was televised live back in Melbourne, so it was done. So it was 8:30 here back in Melbourne. I said, what were you doing? He said, oh, I was, um, I, I got a phone call from the guys back at um, Melbourne and they were watching live over there and they rang him on his mobile. And they actually, true story, they put together two hundred dollars to see if he could run onto the ground and try and dack him. He saw his moment and he was on his way out to, um, to come and dack me. And um, just block your ears for a minute. But I actually never wore undies in my whole career. Um, so I never wore undies in my whole career. So I didn't do it. But um, yeah, so I a funny moment. But um, look, as I say before about. Um, you know, because footy for me was about, you know, it's like an occupation. I actually never really got nervous in games, even in the grand final night, because to me, I, I couldn't really control what was going to happen. I could only control how I reacted, and the best way I reacted was when I kept pretty calm. And I think, you know, I try and tell all my guys that. I, I can tell even the guys that I coach who get a little bit nervous because they get, they try and be too correct, and they, they pace a little um, more in the free kick. So if, if um, in my word of advice, if you do bit like that, I usually tell our blokes to go out in the pre, pre-match warm-up and run the shit out of themselves because what it does, it really flattens them a little bit and by taking, by flattening them a little bit, it just takes their edge off and then once they get into the game proper, they tend to umpire really well. Um, obviously in the um, Eastern Free League, you know, you have 466 umpires I think the last count is um, and we've got, you know, variants of um, guys who train, guys who don't have their training attendance gone up by about 20 to 30 percent um, because last year I actually appointed only guys who, who trained to, to grand finals and, and finals and that really hurt a lot of blokes who used to just get it and I didn't give a shit because I'd actually rather give it to guys who, who were committing and were putting in and I didn't, I was prepared to take maybe a couple of hits that they weren't necessarily the, um, the best umpires going around and then the very next year we up, this year we ended up having an extra 20 to 30 percent of training and um, so we'll get around about 160 70 odd to train, I reckon, which is not bad, um, considering, you know, we've got 460 odd, a lot of the 460 odd kids who play for you and stuff. Um, I coach our senior field up on the squad, so it's about 140 of them, um, and um, so basically, I, my philosophy is, revolves around playing all highs, and it's as simple as that. I'm not really interested in, in holding balls, clubs don't tend to worry too much about it. I only get phone calls is when, when our blokes miss a high or do anything like that. And for me, everything else seems to flow because it's the only matter of fact free kick that's in the rule book is a high tackle. You know, everything else is interpretation. And we try and um, give the players a little bit more time and opportunity to dispose of it because at, at this sort of level of footy, skill level is pretty ordinary. So, um, so our philosophy is really sort of basic. Um, 
we've got some terrific young kids coming through, like 16, 17 year olds up on senior first division footy, and first division footy, you know, got ex AFL blokes playing there and all that stuff. But we've got a really good system in place, we've got um, uh, four or five different programs, really young umpires developing. Scott McHone looks after a, a list of our junior um, up and coming umpires. Um, so it's really good, really well developed. I didn't really have a hell of a lot to do. That was more than my predecessor, um, um, uh, Cameron Nash. So, um, but I've sort of tried to keep that going. Um, probably, probably about it. Um, is there anything else you want to mention? If guys got any questions, it's probably best if I open up to any questions. Yeah. What about uh, Jimmy Stein? What was he like out there on the ground? Um, I've got to say, I don't. Well, I'm not an umpire. When did he finish? I can't remember, so I oh, can't really recall him, so I'm not 100% sure how he actually unplugged him. Any questions at all, guys? Did you actually have any um, arguments over Brownlow votes? Uh, yeah, so Brownlow, was, that was a, that's a good question. Um, I was um, unplugged in the game that James heard. Remember, they had that last quarter against West Coast where he kicked off three goals, a match winning performance, and the week before he, he had a go at Scott McLaren, and everyone thought that we deliberately didn't get him face because of what happened with Scott McLaren. But um, what people fail to remember is that, you know, West Coast I think, were up by four or five goals at three quarter time. Um, but Matthew Lloyd kicked nine goals that day, very easy to give him three votes. Very easy to give um, Judd, who had 42 possessions, and Ben Cousins, 41 possessions, three votes as well, because those guys played, uh, sorry, three, two, and one. Those guys played four great quarters. Who might have made a bit of a difference at the end, but that's just the way it went. So, um, you know, tossing up things like that. Um, but, you know, quite often you would spend 20, 30 minutes arguing over this because don't believe the things that we, you know, we look at stat sheets or anything like that, stats are proper, whatever. But we do take a bit of a sneaky look at it, uh, the scoreboard because occasionally stats will come up there. So it gives you a bit of a guide, I guess. But I'll tell you, most guys, guys do tend to look at it. Professionalism of the Brownlow, we actually have to make sure and tell them, can you please make sure we turn the vests off and ensure that they've turned them off first before we can start talking to each other. Because you almost have to sometimes write instead of talk and write and stuff. They're a lot better at it now, so they usually turn them off a little bit earlier because Tom and them will let them on and things like that. So you have to be really careful what you see. The analysis come on, um, like Woody uh, 360, where Diesel come on and give us sort of. That's going to be human nature, that's what comes in. Yeah. Apparently, what is smart. I don't know, but yeah. that's what I've heard. So. Yeah. Yeah. Now, just you're saying a few of the players and that were the smartest. Were there any of your colleagues? Like, I've heard a story of like Jerry Goldstein when the microphone came in, he used to swear all about the ground and he had to confirm that. Was there any sort of. Yeah, like, absolutely. So, um, Goldie gave whatever he got, basically. And, and, and that's, you know, a matter of fact. And um, I can remember my first year, um, remember. Um, Murphy, Justin, no, not Justin Murphy, who's Justin Murphy? Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, was he? And um, he called me a wanker, right? He said, oh, you're a wanker. And I said, no, you're the wanker, mate. And he goes, I'm dobbing on you. <laughs> and, and that's his, no joke, that's his exact words, I'm dobbing on you. He said, you called me a first, mate. And he goes, oh, I don't care, you can't talk to me like that. And so there were some players where you couldn't say anything. They were allowed to say it to you, you couldn't say it to them. And I was actually got a bit of poo over it. And so I learned a lesson straight away there, there and then. And, um, but, you know, there's no real interaction anymore. It's pretty mm -hmm. non-existent, so, yeah. Anything else, guys? Yes, ma'am. How did the microphone, did that change the way you were on or the way you acted on the ground? Um, yeah, and there's a couple of ways it did. Um, like, I just curb, curb mine, um, what I used to say, because I used to give feedback on whatever I got. But also, I saw it as a bit of an opportunity, too. And, and probably my opportunity was, um, I felt, and I could 
could see that a couple of other guys were going really well. Um, they used to explain the decisions a bit, so I thought, oh, well, maybe if I do that, I might actually help me with my career, but also get the message so the commentators knew and lots of stuff. So I started doing it, and in the end, and you were saying, yeah, I think you were saying, like, I used to talk too much, and to be honest with you, I hated being seen to be like that, but I did it because it helped me in my standing with our coaches and all that stuff, but also <coughs> to be with the media, so that they, or the, the, the telecast, so they knew what I was, what I was seeing. So, yeah, it was probably, oh, I wouldn't say fabricated, but I, I did it because it was an opportunity to do it, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a reason you think that away, do um, um, A couple of things. I had a really bad back, and I still got fat from, so I actually had, I'm um, still on like a work cover type stuff. Um, so my back's uh, pretty knackered. I've got three bulging discs um, and a slip in my spine. And that's all through bouncing and all that. That was getting a bit hard. Three kids too. Um, they're all young. I hated travelling, really hated travelling. And I'd rather go a year earlier than a year too late. And plus I've got my wife permission that year, not um, at the end. So I thought it was probably the, the best time. And plus I love cricket. And so I was still playing cricket off the and I wanted to actually have three or four years off um, before I finished. Still playing for it? Yeah, still playing. I've just got a new coaching job and lots of stuff, and I just love it. So We, we should quote Michael no, Sidney no, 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 with no, his no. background, and I will say this. That's the biggest <laughs> East Fox Hill CC Team of the Century, <laughs> 9 by 100s and 41.50s, high score of 159 not out. We've got the batting average and the bowling average. So he says he likes his cricket. So and that was, so, and um, in my last year, I, this is a true story, my last year, when I was still on time, actually was interviewed, getting interviewed for senior coaching jobs in local footy, and because um, I actually spoke to a couple of people, I was pretty interested in that, and I actually got signed as a senior coach in the amateurs, and um, I was actually coaching there for about um, seven or eight weeks in the pre-season until I got my job with the e EFL, and because it was a full-time job, I actually had to give up coaching footy, so I was pretty passionate about trying to get into coaching and this has probably worked out really well in the one side, so yeah. Um, what's the uh, fitness regime like? Uh, uh, yeah, great question. Um, so, uh, obviously, some of the guys at AFL freaks, you know, absolute freaks. But just to give you an indication, a guy called Darren Wilson, who's a 12 um, time AFL grand final umpire, 11 boundary umpire, he's only within 5 to 10 seconds or something like that of being an A qualifier for the Olympic teams and stuff like that. In, whether it be 3,000 metres or whatever, he's unbelievable. So some of these guys running 10Ks in 34, 30, 30 something minutes, you know, like just unbelievable sort of stuff. Um, you know, um, so you can see what I'm, talk, what I'm sort of saying. Hayden Kennedy, who retired only two years ago at the age of 43, 44, 495 games, was still in the top three umpires when he ran. So we're talking, you know, like he would run a, a 4K, did you guys see 4Ks around the line? Uh, whatever, but um, he used to run like something like 11, you know, 11 minutes and stuff like that before Kate like a freak at, at his age, you know. Um, so, you know, these guys run four, five, six days a week. Um, Hayden was a sort of like, this is sort of professional, and this is why he um, by 495 games. I'll never forget the story he told me, he, um, you know, he's got three kids and he went out one night and bought, bought him uh, fish and chips. So he went and bought him fish and chips and he was eating his salad. And he walked over and there was just one potato cake left, so he ate the potato cake. After dinner, he felt really guilty about it. He went out for 4K run, run off the uh, potato cake. <laughs> he used to go with his family and all these functions of the 20Ks. Off they'd go, he would, they would drive there and he would run home and things like that. So 